Good, good singing. John chapter 4 in your Bible. John chapter 4. We, um, we went out and talked to people yesterday. Sometimes when you go out and try to just talk to people and you go door to door and try to reach people and try to help them. I remember when I was little, man, um, if somebody came to our door selling something, they got a rude awakening. My dad was not happy with people coming to our door. They had a guy one time came to our door and I don't think there was really a law that said no soliciting. My dad thought there was a law that said no soliciting. And uh, he grabbed the guy by the collar and walked him out and set him on the curb and held him on the curb until, uh, until the police showed up. He called the police and held him on the curb. We had another guy that, that uh, called us one time and said, I, wanna, I don't know how they did this way. He said, I'm going to come to your house and I'm gonna, I want to uh, sell you something. And we're giving away a free cordless phone. Well, that was back in the day when cordless phones were something, you know. And, uh, and so we, we, everybody all had the, the rotary phones on a, on a cord that if you try to walk very far, you'd get pulled back. And so it was a cordless phone. We're like, oh, this is pretty cool. So my dad was like, all right, you can come to my house. So the guy showed up, no lie. That's how it went. The guy knocked on the door. My dad opened the door like this and said, where's the phone? And the guy said, probably said, pass it to me. The guy passed it. He looked at the phone and said, all right, you can come in. Let him come in. My dad hated anybody coming to the door. And so I, I can, when I go to people's door and try to talk to them about Jesus, I, I mean, I'm telling you, I feel that pressure of my dad on the other side of the door every time. I'm just thinking some guy's going to grab my collar, jerk me up, and put me on the curb and hold me down. The truth of the matter is, when it comes to that, we're not, we're not really soliciting. People don't understand it all the time. Um, we're not soliciting. I'm not trying, when I've come to your door, if somebody goes to your door from this church or any other church that cares about souls, we're not coming to your door to, to get anything from you or to sell you anything at all. What we're really coming to do is saying, have you ever, and, and really we're not a, aggressive or, or anything, like we're just coming and saying, have you ever considered your soul? Do you, do you know where you'd go? Would you please take this and read it if you get a chance to read it? Um, I talked to a guy yesterday. We went out and it was shocking. Most times nobody comes to the door. It was, everybody was home yesterday and they all came out. Me and Micaiah went and everybody was coming out. And I talked to a guy yesterday, and I have an appointment to go to him right after church today to go back and talk to him. He was doing his yard, and his yard looked fantastic, and I was bragging on his yard and, and talking to him a little bit. And he said, I said, you know, do you know anything about Jesus Christ? We kind of worked into that conversation. He said, no. He said, but I'm interested to know, but I can't talk right now. I said, well, can I come back? He said, I would be happy if you came back. So I'll come back tomorrow. And he had a time. He said, you can come back tomorrow. I said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. What time? He said, after lunch. I said, I'll be there. So I'm planning on going back and talk to him uh, today. We're, we're going from door to door. We're going to talk to people, not because we're trying to get anything from anybody. In fact, we're trying to give them eternal life. That's what we're trying to, hopefully, they would pick up on that and get that. And I think there's been bad experiences people have had, and that's the reason why they're, they're upset with that kind of stuff. I knocked on the door one time of a guy, and the whole time I was talking to him. And I was, I mean, I'm concerned when I go there. Most of the time I'm, I'm praying as I'm walking up to the door. And the guy came to the door, and he was looking over his shoulder the whole time, and he said, look, the finals is on, basketball finals is on. And he says, I really don't have time to talk to you, and I'm really not interested. I'm really more interested in this game that's going on. And here's the thing that this guy never realized. He never will realize until he stands before the Lord that if, he's, if he never gets saved, that he came that close to someone giving him the opportunity. That, not that I, I can't do anything for anybody other than just give you what this says, but he came that close, and the final four just robbed him of the opportunity to have eternal life. And, um, and, and it, it really broke my heart when I left because I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not there, I promise you, I'm not there to get anything from you. Paul said, I don't want yours, I want you. I don't want anything from you, I want your heart. And that's what we're trying to do. And, and, uh, and so with that in mind, I'm, I'm kind of in this spot of John chapter 4, and I want to talk to you about divine appointments. That sometimes God sets up times in our life for us to be a witness or to try to help somebody in the way that they're living or where they're at or, or seeing Christ and it's an opportunity. This, this uh, week or two ago, I was driving, we, we put a little flower bed, all the plants are small right now, they're going to grow up bigger, but we put a little flower bed over in this corner at the, where the sign is at and I was on my way to go meet the guy to talk to him about it and give him a check and as I was driving, I saw a blue pickup truck driving in front of me off to the side I'm about to tell on myself here in just a second, but I, was, I, was, I saw a blue pickup truck, and it had a circle on it that said uh, Heroes on the Water, and it had wings off of it, and on the top of it, it said, um, like, paddling, healing, and helping, and I thought, oh, this must be fishermen that are, like, kayak fishermen. Well, I love kayak fishing, so I thought, i got to figure out who these people are, so 
again, this is the bad, bad part. While I was driving, I'm talking to Siri about trying to find out who Fisherman or Heroes on the Water is. So she told me who they were, and they had a phone number. So I called them, and I said, hey, who are Heroes on the Water? And so the guy kind of told me a little bit about it's a, it's a nonprofit that helps people that are wounded veterans, and it takes them out uh, on the water and, and it gets them involved in fishing, provides the equipment, provides all the, all the kayaks, things like that. Oh, well, that's a pretty good deal. He said, are you interested in getting involved? And I said, well, we have a, a ministry that's Wounded Spirits, and we help people that are dealing with that kind of stuff. We would like to get involved maybe with showing them where they can go to get some of the, the help and get involved in this. And he said, well, we'd love to partner up with you. He said, uh, on that same page, you can put your name and your information and your, your email address. So, again, telling myself while I'm driving, you can autofill. It's not that big a deal. So hopefully the... <laughs> The police officer's not listening to, out to the hallway. But, so it was like when it gets the name, it, it shows up my name. I can just hit it and it shows up. And so I wasn't like actually typing E-R-I-C-K, but I, but I could hit it and then autofill night, autofill my email address and then hit submit. Well, a couple days later, I'm, I'm sitting there and my phone rang and a guy called me and uh, he said, hey, I hear that you were calling uh, Heroes in the Water. And um, I said, yeah. He said, would you like to be the treasurer? And I said, no. I said, I, I don't have time. I don't have time to do anything much. I don't have time to go fishing myself much time, much less time to, to be involved in your organization in that capacity. I just wanted to figure out how I could hook people up with you and help them. And, uh, and he said, uh, so you're a veteran, right? He said, yeah. He said, uh, you ever been in CID? I said, well, yeah. As a matter of fact, I had. I thought, this is kind of interesting that he's even going there. And he said, yeah, I used to work in CID too. I was, in, uh, I was on a drug team. I said, oh, I used to work on a drug team. And I'm still not putting any of this stuff together. And then he says, uh, yeah, I was in Hawaii. I said, I was in Hawaii. <laughs> and, uh, this is just how stupid I was. I, w I had been taking a nap at the time when the guy called, so that was probably part of it. I said, uh, I said, I was in Hawaii. I said, what years were you in Hawaii? He said, 97 to 2000. I said, I was there at the exact same time. And he says, I know Eric. It's his Jason. And I said, Jason. And you know how it is when you can't remember somebody, but you're supposed to remember them? You go, oh, Jason. And I was thinking, who in the world's Jason? <laughs> so I was, and then I, I thought, but I didn't know him as Jason. I knew him as Jay, and that's the reason why. And he said, uh, I was there with you. We used to work with you in, on the under, undercover drug team. And I said, oh, that's right. And he said, of all things, he said, I am, like, really high up in Heroes on the Water. He said, and when you sent your email address, it has Christ in the title of it. I won't put it out. People will be emailing me at the end of the service. <laughs> but, but it has Christ in the title. And when I email, sent him. They looked at it and they said, well, this guy must be religious. And they said, let's don't send it to Jay. Jay won't want to talk to this religious guy. But when they sent it to him, it had to go by because he's high up in the deal. When it went by him, he's like, this guy spells his name E-R-I-C-K and his last name's Knight. He said, I only know one person that spells with a name like that. That's got to be the guy I used to work with in Hawaii. And, uh, and so if you can ever find pictures of me, I had the, the we'd go in the raves, I had the bell-bottom pants on and like the hat on weird and the oversized shirts, but I never, I never was the guy. I didn't fit the part. I was the guy that had a gun to be in there in case something went bad. I wasn't those guys. There was two guys, this guy, another guy that looked the part. They were in there. I was just in there to be help. And, and, uh, and he said, when I saw that name, I thought, I know who that guy is, and I'm calling him. And he said, we didn't think you'd want to call him because he's religious, and we didn't think you'd want to. He goes, ah, I want to talk to him. So we got on the phone, and I was able to talk to him for quite a while, and it was really good. And he said, I'm so glad that you saw that sticker on the back of that, that vehicle. He said, because I am so glad to get to talk to you. He said, what a, what a strange, small world we live in. It is the case, and I said, Jay, has anybody ever talked to you about your soul and where you're gonna be at one day? He said, yeah, but I don't, I don't really know much of it. You know, he, he really kind of brushed it off like most people would do. So we, talk, we talked for quite a while, and I finally got to that point, and he said, I'd love it if you could come out here and see me. And I said, you tell me when, and I'll be there. And he said, if you can't, I'll fly out there to where you're at. I'd like to see you. And I said, well, I'll be there. To me, that's what got me thinking this way. That was a divine appointment. Every time God's doing things in your life to kind of get you set up with people so that you can be used as a, as a mouthpiece for him to help somebody. And, um, and so that's kind of the idea. Look at John chapter 4 and uh, look at verse number 4. Now look at verse number 3. He left Judea, this is Jesus, and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. He's going to go through Samaria. And the Jews had problems with Samaritans. It's a completely different story, but they were like a half-breed of the Jews and another people, and so there was a contention between them already. Verse 5, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, 
which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away in the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest, watch this now, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, that's the idea I want you to see, is this divine appointment of God setting this up. And I want to give you maybe just about four points here that I hope will be a blessing and a help to you to get you to see something about this, maybe help you a little bit this morning. The first thing I want you to get when you're dealing with people or you're working with a divine appointment or working with somebody, the very first thing is you're going to have to see um, the person. You may even see past the person a little bit and see if there's more to the story than just the person. When, when it, you look at this, you see Jesus going into an area that there's a little bit of a contention between the Jews and the Samaritans. I already kind of brought that out. But the, watch the way the woman responds to him. And when I read this, uh, she says, uh, he says, there, can you give me a drink? And her response is a little bit contentious. She says back to him, the woman of Samaria, unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, ask his drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? It'd be like saying, how are you talking to me when I know that you don't like people like me? A little bit contentious. And I'm telling you that if you go to talk to people, sometimes one of the first things you'll have to get past is you'll have to get past over yourself. You'll have to get over a little bit of the fact that they might not be just looking with open arms ready to receive you to give them the gospel. They might have some issues with you. They might say some things, and they might come across a little bit aggressive. We talked to a guy yesterday. I knocked on the door, and, and a little kid answered, and I said, you know, is there an adult present? And he said, Papa, come here. And an older guy came out, and the guy came out like, I do not want, I really had flashbacks. I thought pretty soon by collar out to the road. And, and the guy was like, I really don't want anything to do it. And I said, okay, can I just give you this? You just read it when you get a chance. And, and I thought it occurred to me, he had a great big uh, bass boat sitting out in the, in the front, with uh, the talon things in the back for, the, for their, their, uh, their anchors. And I thought, you know, people got those on there. They're pretty serious about their fishing. So I said, I gave him that, and I said, hey, I noticed that boat out front. Are you a fisherman? Well, all of a sudden, he was aggressive at the beginning. But when I started talking about fishing, he was like, oh, yeah. He shut the door behind him, came outside, and he's ready to talk now. Now we're having a great conversation. And we're talking about different colors of catfish, and I caught a yellow one. The yellow one, those are pretty good to eat. We, and we were, next thing you know, we're just talking about catfish and stuff. I'm just telling you that if you're going to, there, there could be a divine appointment. And what we're quick to do sometimes is somebody doesn't come across exactly like the way we think. And we just write them off immediately. Well, they're not happy. They're not receiving me. So I'll just write them off and move on. And it may be, listen, sometimes we get so like just, just right in their face saying stuff. It may take a little bit of time of talking to people first before you ever get to the point of really talking about things that really even matter. And so can you see past the person, the person kind of putting you off, can you see past the culture? Now for some people, now in the military town, this is not as big an issue as it is in other places. In a military town, we are a mel- America is a melting pot, a military town is a melting pot of a melting pot. We don't have as much issues with some of this stuff. But in some areas, they'll be like, well, I ain't going over there. That's the wrong side of the tracks. That's the wrong attitude to have anyway. I, when I was, uh, I pastored that little church for just a little bit of time down in Houston. And, uh, and really, there was three families. It was three, three deacons and their wives, and that was it in the church. And the only reason why they were there is because they were the ones that started that church. And they were just going to stick it out, to ride it out all the way to the very end. And that whole area was infested, was a gang uh, infested area. It was the gangster disciples. They spray painted in six foot letters on the house across the street, gangster disciples across the front of somebody's house across the street. The DEA set up in the parking lot one time. It was before I got there or just before I got there. And they said, there's a man that's dead in that building there. That there's a drug deal. We're about to go bust that house. This is the, across the street from the church that we were in. And, uh, and all the area around there was Spanish speaking or Hispanic people. And so, uh, and a lot of them were broken homes. And one of the men that was there, and I know that he, he meant well, but the, the spirit was just the wrong spirit. He said, I've done a, a search of whitepages.com that has people's names, and I've marked out every name that appears to be Hispanic 
and I just saved all the ones that appear to be white people. I'd like for us to only visit those people. I said, why would you do that? He says, well, there's no way we're going to be able to build our church off of Hispanic people and broken homes. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, who builds the church? Do I build the church? Do you build the church? Or does God build the church? He says, I don't like where this is going. I said, well, I'm just asking you. My job is to sow the seed somebody else waters. God gives increase. I'm not going to pick and choose. I'm not going to say, your skin's too brown or your skin's too this. I'm not going to your house. You don't have a husband. and you've got, you've got children, but you don't have a husband. You're a broken home. I refuse to talk to you about Jesus. What kind of world do we live in where that's the way we approach Christianity? So there's an idea of, you know, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We normally don't talk to each other. You're going to have to get past some of those things. The initial kind of contention that might be there, you've got to get past that. And you'll have to get past some of the cultural issues as well. You may have to get past some of their condition. You might find somebody that looks, that does not look the part. Okay? They don't look. You might think, well, I, you know, I'd like to, if, if I could, I'd like to witness to that guy that's the banker down there that's in a three-piece suit because i really like for him to sit next to me at church. But that, that person, let's say a gang member, I don't know that I really want them sitting next to me at church, so I might not talk to them. You may have to look past, listen, the contention, you may have to look past the culture, and you may have to look past some, con- some conditions. There was a lady came here one time. I don't know how much of this sermon I'll even give to you this, this morning. There was a lady came here one time, and uh, it was in the other building. And uh, she walked in, and she had a big teardrop tattooed on her face right here, had stars tattooed on her face, and she had tattoos all over her. And she came in, and she was crying. She said, I'm, I'm, I've recently got saved. I'm trying to get on the right track. My daughter is graduating from, um, from, uh, from high school in Lampasas, and I'd like to be able to go to her graduation. And a lot of times when somebody asks me something, I'll just kind of quietly pray and see if I can discern if God's, you know, what's, what's the deal with this? Most of them I can ask enough questions to figure it out. And uh, well, she began to weep and she began to cry. I didn't put her in a car with me. I just told her, I said, if you'll drive, I'll drive. And I'm going to drive you. First place we'll go is to Coles, or not Coles, to Ross up here. And I'm going to buy you a gift card to get up some clothes. Because she said, I need clothes. Then we went to Walmart and I bought her a gift card to buy her some, get her some. She said, I need to get makeup. I want to cover up my face a little bit. I said, okay. And I wouldn't tell her to do this. She said that she needed this. I got her a gift card for Walmart. And then she said, I hate to ask you. But I got a dog in the car, and we were out of dog food. Can you, so I drove her to this dog food place over here, dog place, and got her some dog food and, uh, and tried to be a help, help to her and, uh, and tried to kind of seal, seal her on the gospel and make sure she knew. That was, you know what? I never saw that lady again. You say, oh, well, you got took. Well, possibly. She might have moved on. You know what? That lady may walk away thinking. She did not look the part, and she probably was expecting someone to treat her like a dog. But she, what she got taught, whether she was running a scam or not, what she learned was at least somebody cared. And you may have to look past some conditions. Let me ask you this. What if they have a different politics than you? What if you start talking to them? What if you go to their door and they've got a, a sticker on their door that's, that's Republican and you're a Democrat or they're a, they're a Democrat and you're a Republican? What are you going to do? Are you going to automatically have an issue? Or can you get past some of those issues so that you can give them the gospel of Jesus Christ? I promise you this, there's not going to be a Republican or Democrat in heaven. I'd make a joke there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> They'll all be one by, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I'm, but the deal is, there's not going to be that in heaven. Why do we, listen now, I'm saying, why do we make that a point of not talking to people about Jesus or not? Can you see the person? He had to. Can you see the person? And the second point is, can you see the problem? Can you see the problem? Because they're going to have some issues as well. The same issues that you've got, they may have the same issues. They might have some issues with culture. They might look at you and say, and again, in a military town, you might not have this, but they might see you come up to the door and think, oh, well, you're a preacher. And listen now, some people have been around some churches that have presented Christ in the wrong way. And so they've got in their mind, oh, you're one of those people, you hate people, or you're this, or you're that, and they've already got you put in a box, and you may have to work your way out of that box with them. That's the problem you might face with trying to deal with them. And listen, it may be, let me tell you this, it may not be you're going to a door, let's don't just make it a divine appointment of you're at a door, it could be a divine appointment of somebody at your job, it may be your divine appointment that you've been put 
in a place to work with somebody for the next six months to a year that maybe needs Jesus Christ, and God puts you together for that purpose. And they may have to get past some of those things. And you may have to break down some of those barriers with them. And on top of that, you may have to get them past their own condition. Uh, they may feel like, well, I have messed my life so much up that there's no way that Jesus could ever save somebody like me. And that's just simply not true. They just sing the song that there is no sin that grace can't take care of. And that's the truth. The Bible says where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. That's just the truth of the matter of the fact. I was knocking on the door in Atlanta, Georgia one time. I was talking to a guy, and the lady came to the door, and I was talking to her, and she said, uh, you know, I'm saved, but my, my husband, and Stacy and I were trying to figure, his, his last name was Swim. I think his name was Thomas Swim. I can't really remember it to this day, but it made such an impact on me that I, was, I talked to him for a few minutes, and we sat on the front porch, and I said, listen, there's a heaven and hell. The, the difference is, is not how, many, how much good you've done, but if you place your trust in Jesus Christ. And we went through some of that in the gospel, and he began to weep a little bit. We were both soldiers, so we could we kind of relate a little bit. And he said, I deserve to go to hell, and I'm going to hell, and I deserve to go there, and I want to go there. So I never, never in my life heard somebody say something like that. And I said, why would you think you deserve to go there, and you want to go there, like you need to go there? And he told me a story of being in Afghanistan, and, uh, and, and a little boy ran at their convoy with a bag, and they kept telling the little boy to stop, and he wouldn't stop, just ran at him with a bag. And he was told he'd have to shoot the kid, he didn't shoot him. And uh, because they thought it was a bomb, he was going to blow up the convoy. And when they got to the little kid, it was a bag of candy. And <laughs> well, I couldn't imagine. And, uh, and this guy was so tore up over that, he had never got over it. And he said, I'm going to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. And uh, he didn't want to talk anymore. He was distraught. I came back a couple of days later, and I led that man to the Lord. And let me say this. I don't want it to sound like I did something. That man got saved. I'll put it that way. And, and, here's, and here's the reason why. I came back, and I showed him people like David and people like Paul that God had saved, that had murdered and committed adultery and all the things they had done. And when he saw that, I'm telling you, when he saw that his eyes, he'd never seen that before, his eyes got so big where he realized that God can save somebody like me. And so the problems you're maybe going to face is you, you may have to dig some people out of some, out of some pits with your conversation you have with them. You may have to actually talk with them. You might not be able to just get right to the point. You may have to talk with them a little bit. Listen, when people, the divine appointments God may put you in your life, it may be people that have really tied themselves up in some pretty nasty knots in their life. And you may have to help them untie a little bit of those knots to help them see Jesus a little more clearly. But here's what's interesting. In this first part of this conversation, she refers to him just as a Jew. Just, he's a Jew. But I want you to see the next little part that happens there. You've seen the person. You've got to be able to see the person. You've got to be able to see the problem. But then you're going to have to see the point and get them to see the point. Watch what he says here in verse number 11. The woman saith unto him, Sir... Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that, that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? And yes, he was. Which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be, watch, in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman gets to the place that Jesus is really trying to point her to. She says this, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. He said, I, I want whatever you're talking about. I, I want that water. But she's only understanding it at a certain level. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And so I want you to see something. This is the, the heart of the message is this part right here. That he begins to talk to her about this well of water. And this is important because he's going to do this. He's going to talk to her about a well. He's going to go on in verse number 15 to 19, talk about her being a wife. And then he's going to go on talking about worship. And I want you to see something in all these. He's getting to a point. Jesus is not spending time talking to her about a well because he's concerned about household water treatment and he's concerned about how to dig a well and how to, re how to, how to reinforce walls. He's not, he doesn't care about the, a well. He's trying to get her to see her great need, the point of what he's trying to do. I want you to watch what he's trying to do here when he does this. He goes through a few things. In verse number 10, 
through verse number 12, he says, If you knew, if you just knew the gift of God and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me drink, thou, would, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The thing he's trying to get her to see is, it's not really about the well, it's not really about the water, it's about Jesus Christ. And he's trying to get her to see that when she comes daily, Every day she's coming at a certain hour when everybody else is away. She comes and she draws water over and over and over again. And he says that you keep drawing of this water and it never satisfies your thirst. You know why? Because you've got to come back the next day and draw more water. Or maybe later on in the afternoon and draw more water. And that it never satisfies. You've got to come back another day and draw more water. And what he's saying to her is, if you would just get a hold of me, I would satisfy your thirst and you would never thirst again. In fact, it wouldn't be something you've got to keep coming back to and keep coming back to and never be satisfied. You'll be completely satisfied inwardly, not outwardly. Something would be in you that would change and it would be living water. Living water is water that continuously springs up. You know what he's saying to this lady? And it's going to be a lady that has got six different husbands now. She's, a, she's in a bad condition. Culturally, she's different. And he's taking the time to talk to her and tell her that, look, you need to be satisfied with something that really satisfies your thirst and not something else. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of people you're going to talk to that are trying to find things in this world to satisfy them over and over again. And what they really need to find is the only satisfaction they need is found in Jesus Christ. And if they would ever get a hold of who Jesus really is, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute as we go on, he's more than a church, he's more than a denomination, he's more than in all those types of, of outward things we do. It's something inside that springs up and takes care of your thirst forever. That's what it is. And so he's trying to get her, he's showing her a picture. It's not about a well. The well is just an illustration to show her you need something deep inside of you that will take care of you for eternity. And when she gets to the end of that illustration, you know what she says to him? At first she started off and she said, I want you to see the progression of how she's getting it. When he first talks to her, she says, hey, you're just some Jew and I'm a Samaritan. What are you doing talking to me? Now... Her interest has peaked a little bit with the illustration he gave, and she says, Sir, it's changed. Do you see the change? It's moved from, You're a Jew, I'm a, Jew, I'm a Samaritan, what do you want? Now it's moved to, Sir, how do I get that water? And now she says, Sir, and I think she's getting it, but I don't think she's got it completely. And that's why you've got the next part. I want you to see the next part. Watch what he says in verse 15. I'm talking to you about divine appointments. You realize it'll take a little bit of time to get and a divine appointment to get to where you're needing to go with somebody. Verse 15, watch what it says. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She's thinking it has to do with, I don't ever have to come walk all the way over here to my water pot again. She's only getting it at a certain level. She doesn't get it quite yet. And so watch what Jesus does. Verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said I have no husband. He, he sees right through the little, the little smoke and mirrors she tries to give him. Verse number 18, For thou hast had five husbands. Can you imagine her surprise when he called out the number there? You've had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. Leading me to think it's probably somebody else's husband. In that sayest thou truly. He said, Now, when you said you have no husband, you're, you're speaking the truth. You had five of them, and the one you're with now isn't your husband. The woman saith unto him, watch where she's got with him now. Sir, I perceive that thou art a what? Well, he used to be a Jew. Now he's a sir. And now she says, I think you're a prophet. You're seeing something at a deeper level. than, And that's what I'm wanting you to see. Listen now, I want you to get this. When you talk to people, you're going to have to see at a deeper level than just some surface, uh, this woman's a, a harlot. She's got five different husbands and she's living with somebody now. You're gonna, listen now, listen real close. You're going to have to see past all of that to see a soul that's in need of a Savior. I don't, uh, this is just me and you can see it a different way and when you preach, you can preach it however you want to preach it. I don't think he asked her, go get your husband because he was trying to rub her nose and her problems. I really don't think that's the issue. I think what he was trying to do is the same thing he tried to do with the well. 
Remember I told you, the first illustration he gave her was the well saying this. You know what you do? Watch now. This is real good. Everyone of you need to listen to this. You know what you do with this well? You keep coming back every day and try to find something to satisfy you. And you have to come repeatedly and find it and get it and take it back. And it never satisfies, right? You know what he's saying to her about this husband issue now? You know what you keep doing? You keep going from man to man to man to man looking for something to satisfy you. And the reason why you're on your sixth one now that isn't even your husband is because you've never found true satisfaction in some person. I think that's what he's trying to get her to see. I don't think Jesus is, is a type that he's trying to like. Now, let me tell you, with Pharisees, he straight out called them a bunch of vipers. That's a little different. Well, this woman, I don't think he's saying, here, come here, let me rub your nose or something. I think he's trying to say, can you see that you have been trying to find satisfaction in all the wrong places? This well that you keep coming to, it's never going to satisfy you. You need Jesus to satisfy you. These relationships you keep trying to, listen now, listen real close. There are people doing this in this room. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about you're promiscuous and running around different people. I'm telling you that in your heart, though, you're looking for somebody to validate you and make you feel like you're a whole person and you're, a, you're somebody worth something. And I'm just telling you, I want you to listen real close. You are worth something to God. And you're worth something to Jesus. You say, well, how do, how do I know I'm worth anything? You're worth God sending His Son to this earth to die in your place because he loved you that much, because you were worth something to him. That's, that's how much he loved you. You, I told somebody this just the other day, you would never understand the love of God outside of the sacrifice of God. That tells you just how much. God so loved the world. How much did he love the world? That he gave his only begotten son. It's a qualifier of the love. It tells you just how much he loved you. And what people are doing is they're running around looking for, there's people doing this all the time. They're looking for, I've said it before, looking for affection, looking for acceptance, they're looking for attention. And most of you sit in the room and you're going to say, I'm not looking for that. I don't, I don't need any of that. But deep down in your heart, you are looking for it. You're looking for acceptance. You want people to accept you. You want people to approve of you. You want people to love you and show you affection. You want security in your life. Everybody in this room, everybody in here wants it, whether you admit it or you don't. Most of you are like, I don't need anything. You're a liar. You do need something. Every, it's built into every person. But let me tell you something. That thing that's in you, it's in there on purpose, and it's not meant to be filled by a man. It's not to be filled by a woman. It's not be meant to be filled by a truck or by a car or by a Corvette or by a, a bass boat. or by. It's not meant to be filled by anything. It's meant to be filled by Jesus Christ. And what he's doing, listen, that's all he's doing in this is he's trying first, he shows her the well, and he says, look, there's something deeper here. There's something you're missing inside of you, and you keep coming back to a place to get satisfaction, and satisfaction will only be found in the living water, and he says, I am that living water. And satisfaction is not going to be found in this man, and, and this doesn't work, and you realize it didn't work here, and so you move over here, and you feel like I'm doing pretty good for a little while. I feel accepted. I feel like things are going great until that begins to fall apart, so i got to move to this person. And every place you're moving to is just trying to validate you and make you feel whole, and the only one that really makes you feel whole is Jesus Christ. Amen. So he's saying this, and listen, this, what I'm telling you is, as you're talking to people and you're trying to help them, this is the point you're trying to get to. You're trying to get them to the point to see that it's about Jesus. We sat yesterday, and, and uh, me and, and, uh, and Micaiah, and we knocked on one door, and a lady came to the door, and her head, her head was shaved up here, and just a little bit on top, and just dyed really uh, bright green, and she came out, and I could tell she had a little bit of a um, contention to her about what we were going to say, and I, I kind of braced myself. I thought, man, she's going she's gonna to nail me. And all the other ones have been nice. This lady's going to really give me a run for my money. She's going to get mad at me in just a minute. And, uh, and really, I'm not there to fight or argue. And if, if they said I'm not interested, I'd be like, okay, read this, and I'm gone. And I'm just hoping they get, they get Jesus. And, um, and uh, so I, I asked her, and somebody says, why would you go to somebody's house? They don't want you to come to their house. Look, those people need salvation. They're going to end up in hell. 
And if they don't know any better to come here and listen to me tell them about Jesus, I'll try to go there. And you say, well, they're going to hate you for it. Well, I'll, I'll have to suffer the reproach to try to get them to Jesus. And um, so I thought, she's not going to like me very much. I can tell we're not going to see eye to eye. And, uh, and so we just started talking. You asked my kid, we just started talking. And uh, she said, well, I don't believe all this religion. I just believe in a philosophy. I'm, I'm in for philosophy. And all the religions basically, basically say the same thing. They're all about be kind to each other, and, and kindness will come back to you. And, uh, and I'd let her talk, and I'd say, let me say one thing. And I just want you to get this, because I, I feel like you're probably not going to give me very much time to talk. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. What if you get to the end of this life, and you realize that all the philosophy and all the ways you thought were okay, you die and you close your eyes in death and open your eyes on the other side and realize that God was right. And when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that there wasn't many ways, but there was one way. And that God loved you so much that he gave his son to make a way for you to be able to go to heaven and you to have eternal life. Because you have to pay for your sins, and he paid for your sins for you. What happens if that, that's the case? She says, well, they're, you're all based on kindness. I said, no, many of them are based on kindness, but truth, biblical truth, is based on this. It's based on the fact that he died in your place so that you can be saved. That's different than all those other religions. And she listened. She listened to everything we had to say. She took the track, said she'd read it, and, uh, and went in the house. You know what you got to do? You're going to have to get to the point. I talked to another guy that was on the doorstep, and he said, I've been around church all my life. I don't go to church. I said, did somebody hurt you in church? He said, yes. I said, well, there's a lot of people like that. And Brother Micah did a devotion about that right before we came. And I told him about your devotion. And, uh, and I said, I'm sorry that somebody misrepresented God to you and misrepresented church and misrepresented Christ. I'm sorry that that happened to you. Don't let the fact that men are sometimes knuckleheads stop you from seeing that there is a good God that loves you and wants, wants something for you. You know what you're trying to do? You're trying to get them to see the point that they need something. They don't need me. They don't need my church necessarily. They need God. They need Jesus Christ. And so he's doing that with her. He's doing that with her. And when he does that with her, she says, she's moving a little closer and says, I, I perceive something. You're a prophet. So it's not really about the well, and it's not really about the wife thing. Look at verse number 20, and we'll just close this down really quickly. Watch what he says. She says, Our fathers worship in this mountain. She's starting to get a little more. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when... Ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is. Here we are. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, Here's the idea. You know what he's saying? She's saying, well, we, we, we worship in this place, and you worship over in this place. And, and this is what he's trying to get her to see. Again, it's the same point. It's not about the well. It's about getting something deeper than the, than the well. It doesn't satisfy. You need something deeper. It's not about a relationship with a man. It's not about this wife thing. It's something deeper that you need. And listen, it's not about a mountain, and it's not about a city. And it's not about, I go over here or I go over there. Listen, if your Christianity is wrapped up in the fact that you are a member of Victory Baptist Church, you've got a shallow Christianity. It's something much deeper than your denomination or what church you go to or what city you live in or any of those things. It is a relationship that's inside with Jesus Christ. And sometimes people get hung up on all these things. And so, again, that's all the point. The point. You've got to see the point. The point is... You've got to be satisfied with something more than your daily activities, than a person or some building or some city or some ritual or some denomination. It's going to have to be something inside. That's the point he's trying to get to. 
And you know where she gets? Look at verse number 25. This is, the, this is what you're trying to get people. You're trying to get them from moving from, you're just some guy on the, on the porch, a Jew, to sir, to, man, I perceived that a prophet. To verse number 25, watch what he says. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus says unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. You know where she's moving from? She's moved from, hey, you're just some Jew, to sir, I'm, I'm curious, to, man, you're seeing something at a different level than most people see, and you're taking the time to dig deeper than anybody's ever dug before. I perceive that a prophet, to now I see the Christ. You know, that's what you're trying to get any person you talk to with a divine appointment to get them to see Christ. That's what you're trying to do. And not only to see Christ, but then you keep reading there, it says, And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with this woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? And the woman then left her water pot. You know what she was coming there with to get her satisfaction for the day? She left that and went her way into the city and saith unto the men. You know, she's, this woman has been a, a one that's been hanging out with all the men. You know, she's been going to all the men saying, hey, can you satisfy me? Watch, now she's going to the men saying, I can tell you what can satisfy you. And she goes to the men and says, come see. Remember I've been telling you this whole time, you're going to have to see past some things with some people. You're going to have to see past the problems. You're going to get them to have to see the point of what we're talking about. And then if they ever see it, then they're going to be hungry to show other people and get them to see it as well. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the what? The Christ. And that's what we're trying to get people to do with these divine appointments. She moved from in verse number 19 to I perceive. I got a line drawn from I perceive down to verse number 25, I know. And that's what we're trying to do with people. Now, I just want you to finish with this last little look. Look at verse number 31. In the meanwhile, she's back there in the city telling all the men, you need to come with me outside here and come to see a man. He's going to tell you everything. He'll satisfy you. She's getting all of them gathered up to come. Now watch. In the meanwhile, while his disciples prayed to him, saying, Master, eat. But Jesus said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? And Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He's saying, My my satisfaction, what I get, is to do the work of the Father. Watch what he says, verse 35. Think about the context, what he's saying here. Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. You know what he's about to tell these guys? Are you doing the work of the Father? Behold, I say unto you, watch what he says, it's all about seeing. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap, that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Now, I want you to think about something. Verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me all things I did. And when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own words. Now, here's what I want you to get. Jesus had this divine appointment with this woman. He had gotten past all the the person and the problems and her condition and all this stuff and dealt with her and got her to see Christ. You know what he's doing? While she's out there telling those people and gathering them together and they're coming back, Jesus is standing there with all his disciples. You know what he tells them? Lift up your eyes and look. Can you see? The crowd that's coming to you are Samaritans, people you would despise. In fact, in, in Luke chapter number 9, People in Samaria didn't receive him. And two of his right-hand men said, let's just call down fire and kill them all. And he said, you don't even know what kind of spirit you're of. He tells them, he said, look, they're right here in front of you. You're going to have to get your eyes focused on the people that are right around you right now and start telling them about Jesus. It's already full harvest. You're not, listen now, you're not seeing it because you're looking at people a certain way. But if you would just open your eyes and look right outside the door, 
It's already right there. Your divine appointment is coming your way right now. It's right outside the door. Your divine appointment may be somebody, a Samaritan, maybe somebody that doesn't look like you, act like you, talk like you, vote like you, act, you know, any of those things. And they may be at the restaurant you're going to be at in about another five minutes. There's your divine appointment. You need to open your eyes and lift your eyes up and look. They're right here, right now. Don't think about, well, four months comes and then I'll get ready to go harvest. No, 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 it's right here, right now. But you're going to have to start looking. When Jesus started that whole thing, he said, I must needs go through Samaria. You know why he had to go to Samaria? Most people say because of that one woman, and I think that is partially true. But I think also the reason why he had to go to Samaria is so we can get all those disciples to get right there in that spot and see that those people of Samaria are somebody you need to be reaching as well. He needed all of them to get to see that the harvest field was right in front of them, and we need to see the same thing. Let's stand to our feet. You've got divine appointments all around you. If you're not saved today, your divine appointment was this morning being in this church. And if you are saved then you need to be thinking about trying to lead somebody else to the Lord whenever you can and be a witness to them. You say, well, I, I, I don't know that I could do it. Well, you can give them a gospel track. You can give them your testimony. You could tell them something. You say, well, I, I don't, I'm not bold enough to knock on my neighbor's door. Well, then maybe just tomorrow just say something to a, say something to a co-worker and say, now I was at church yesterday and the guy talked about the woman at the well. Never really heard that story before, but man, it sure was interesting and start the conversation. Maybe just be a witness that way. Lord God, we love you and we ask you to bless now. Help us as we try to just look and pay attention to divine appointments. The harvest field truly is white under harvest. We've just got to look. We can't say, give me four more months and then I'll start looking for the harvest. It's right here, right now. Help us, Lord, to start looking. Help us to see past people. Help us to see past problems. Help them to see the point of what we're trying to talk. I'm going to talk to a man in a few minutes, Lord. And I praise you to help me help him see the point. Lord, just do the work now in our hearts. I pray if there's somebody lost, they'd get saved this morning. I pray if there's somebody saved, they'd get a broken heart for others. Father, help us now. We love you. We ask you to bless in Jesus' name. Amen. She's going to play. Why don't you pray? So we're praying. Maybe you've got somebody you know that you want to pray for. Wouldn't it be heartbreaking, breaking to know that you...